hi, my name is Matt Redmond. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Strava. Uh, my background personally is in computational geometry and linear algebra, and I'm fairly new to the geo carto worlds. Uh, so Strava's goal is to build the most engaged community of athletes in the world, and we do this in a number of ways, but the way uh, our, our website works is that runners and cyclists primarily upload GPS-based activities, uh, we process that GPS data and we sort of uh, allow them to compete asynchronously with each other. Uh, so if you are uh, running by yourself, you could go run the same course as one of the pros and compare your times. So here's uh, an example athletic activity. I did this yesterday. Uh, we went to Bainbridge Island and it was delightful. Uh, took a little ride around and you can see that we plot this nice polyline. Uh, I guess we went most of the way around the sort of south half of the island and then we came back. So Strava activities in general are between zero and 200 miles with you know, some, some variance that some people ride crazy along, but for the most part, that's a reasonable bound on, on how far our lines are. Uh, so as I alluded to earlier, we have uh, the, the primary, one of the primitives that we have at Strava is the, Stra the concept of the Strava segment. So a Strava segment is an athlete created polyline to race over. Uh, there, the, the athlete with the fastest time is the queen or the king of the mountain. For historical reasons, it is always of the mountain. It sounds better than regent of the levy or you know, ruler of the flat place. Um, but for the most part, you know, queen or king of the mountain. Um, so segments do come from uploaded activities. Uh, and the way that's done is that users, when creating a segment, choose a start and an end point from their own sensor data. Uh, at, when you upload your activity, your activity is matched against all of the segments in our database, and we do this so that you can track your progress against whatever you're in, most interested in. Unfortunately, sometimes segment quality is terrible. So here's a, uh, an example of uh, what, what our, our segment experience looks like. So this is um, a ride in uh, Northern California, sort of in the, the peninsula region. There's a famous climb here, and you can see you know, an altitude chart, and then also um, an overlay of the GPS data. So Strava uses OpenStreetMap as our backing data store, and we use Mapbox tiles um, with some custom graphic design stuff on top of it. So here's an example. So that was good segment data. Here's an example of, frankly, fairly atrocious segment data. Um, you can see, I think this is, uh, this is in the center of San Francisco. This is uh, the Mount Sutro climb. And whoever built this segment uh, had some interesting GPS noise happening with their device. So uh, they, the segment that got recorded uh, initially veers fairly far off, the, off of the bend there. And anybody who chooses to ride this segment in the future will see this and have, have a bad experience. So it's in our interest to not have our users see this sort of degraded experience. And so one of our goals was to clean this up with a segment repair process. So here's the problem with segments. I think fundamentally, Segment quality is poor because we have this underlying dependency on activity data. And this has a few problems. So for one, uh, the reason that it's based off of activity data is that we expected users to be able to go back and trim their segments. And you, and you wanted to store the original stream so that you could edit segments after creation. But this is kind of a problem. It's a leaky abstraction. Really, in my mind, a segment should be just a stretch of the planet. It should be a polyline. It shouldn't have any time varying data in it. Uh, tying segments to activities also introduces some sampling bias where GPS devices generally record at fixed intervals, usually one hertz on modern devices. Uh, and what this ends up doing is oversampling where athletes are slow and undersampling where they're fast. So in practice, this means we oversample on climbs and we undersample on descents. Uh, and finally, one pr another problem with tying segment data to activity is that as sensors improve, we'd like our segment quality to improve. But if you're tied to a fixed old activity, you have old sensor data and you, you know, lose out on all of the improvements in filtering and all that sort of thing. So one of my goals to fix segments was to build a repair tool. And I had a couple of goals in mind for this repair tool. Namely, I wanted it to be fast. Uh, ideally, I'd run this tool over our entire data set, which is on the order of 10 million segments. Uh, it should be deterministic. I don't really want my repair to give me random results. And I want it to be item potent, which means I should be able to run it multiple times and have the same result as running exactly once. And then finally, and I think the hardest part, is I'd like it to be verifiable. I want my segment repairs to be quantifiably better in some way than the original was. And if they're not better, I want to refuse or reject the repair and keep the original path. 
So the key idea for me was harnessing our segment matching engine. So when you go for a ride or a run, you upload your GPS data, your path is matched against nearby candidate segments. We store these in a big uh, you know, geospatial index and we identify some possible candidates. Those are stored as uh, tiles. And so there's a state machine that goes through and plays your activity path over the set of tiles. Uh, and it keeps track of sort of which tiles you've progressed through, which tiles you've jumped out of. And at the end of the day, it records some matching statistics, how well your activity matched what we think the segment definition is. It's fairly robust, it's well tested, it's been in production for quite a while. And in particular, it's tuned for lenience. So we noticed that we got fewer support tickets when we matched people more leniently than when we were really stringent about exactly how tightly you have to match the segments. So the premise behind using the segment matching is that we already have this large data set of people who have been matched to segments. And instead of using one activity, we can use the collective wisdom of many activities. So to repair a target segment, identify a collection of activities that matched that target, then split it into a training and a testing set. From the training set, you either choose some really good example or with some magic, create a new one, and we'll talk about that later, uh, as a repair candidate. And then finally, what we do with that repair candidate is we test it in, uh, in, as a comparison against the original, against the testing set. Uh, if the statistics are stronger for the repair candidate, then you can accept it, otherwise you can reject it. So there's an asterisk here. Um, if we are using matching data on what is assumed to be a known bad segment, it might stand to reason that the training data itself is somehow tainted or corrupted. And in theory, I think this is actually true. But in practice, we have enough sort of aggregation power that you can get over that. And the repairs turn out pretty well anyways. So I, would, I was hoping to put like one of those little shrugging guy emojis in there, but I don't, I don't know how to do that. So um, Anyway, we'd like to have some notion of choosing a, a exemplar candidate from that training set. What does that mean? Well, ideally we have some notion of centrality. We choose the candidate that looks the most representative of the training set. This problem is a little similar to uh, ca classic calculus of variations problems where we're trying to find the functional that maximizes or minimizes some objectives subject to some constraints. In this case, we're sort of trying to find the element from the set that uh, minimizes the sum distance to the other elements. Um, so, Mean and median are generally fairly well-defined on discrete metric spaces. Uh, so a metric space is a set equipped with a distance function. Um, so on the real line, the common example of you know, mean and median is you can, for the mean, you compute the sum and you divide by the number of elements. And for the median, you can sort of sort the set and then choose the middle one. Um, and this can actually be extended fairly naturally to points in higher dimensional spaces. You just choose you know, your standard Euclidean norm and the mean becomes the centroid. The median's a little trickier because you can no longer sort of sensibly sort these points, but what you can do is define a medoid, which is the element that minimizes the distance to the other points in the set. So as it turns out, the points, the elements in our set aren't points, but they're curves or they're sequences of points. So we need a slightly more intelligent distance function than the standard Euclidean distance. So there's a couple of pretty common uh, distance functions that people talk about. The first one is the Hausdorff distance. The Hausdorff distance is intuitively sort of the maximum point-wise distance from one set to the closest point in the other. This actually loses a lot of information because it treats the sequences of points as unordered sets. Um, and so that's, that doesn't work great in this context. Um, Another alternative notion of a distance measure between sequences is the Frechette distance. I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation of that. Um, but the Frechette distance is intuitively, if you went walking with your dog along each of these curves, what's the longest, uh, sorry, the shortest leash that you could get away with and still walk at your own paces? Um, and this is a little better, it sort of incorporates some notion of sequential points, but it's still a little bit of wasted information. We lose a lot of valuable position information by only looking at the worst position. So here's where uh, the dynamic time warp distance comes into play. Dynamic time warp distance is a fairly robust distance function between sequences. It's not a metric. It doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. Um, so it adds a little bit of complexity there. But it uh, historically comes about from the speech processing community. So the speech processing community had this task of classifying people's phoneme patterns. Um, but people speak at different rates. And you'd like to be able to identify one person saying the vowel O and somebody else saying the vowel O at slightly different frequencies. 
So uh, this community came up with the dynamic time warp distance uh, by warping sounds into the same time domain through alignment. So here's a, probably worth more than me talking about it for 20 minutes, here's a nice picture. Um, so you can look in figure A, those might be two waveforms of people saying the same letter. And in, uh, there is a clever way, which we'll talk about in a bit, to uh, recursively align those sequences, choose this, the, the, uh, the path of indices from Q to C that best represents the correct alignment. So uh, that warp path is shown in figure C. You can sort of see that each point is tied to at least one other point in the other sequence. Um, and so I don't know if, is there not? Yeah, okay. Um, so you can see here, this point here um, on the red curve, Q, it looks like it's tied to a couple of points down here in C. And then similarly, uh, where the pronunciation is made here, uh, you can see that those are tied roughly correctly to the corresponding points down there. So time warp distance then says, we're gonna take, here's, here's how you build it. We're going to define the time warp distance as the uh, the time warp distance of the last cell in a, in a dynamic programming matrix, and we're going to generate it recursively. We're going to say, for each index, you can either follow, take one step in the first time sequence, you can take one step in the second time sequence, or you can take a step at the same time in both of them. Um, and then we greedily build this up, and the time warp distance is the sum of the distance metrics on all pairs of points in that warp path. So, okay, so suppose, let's take it now that we have some sensible notion of distance between sequences of points. Let's talk about segment repair again. We'd like to choose either a central element or an exemplar element from our training set. So in order to do that, we can equip that set with a dynamic time warp distance and compute some medians, woo -hoo. If you actually go about and do this in theory, it should work. You should be able to take your training set and find the central element, and it does work. So here is some data from Strava's data set. This is actually a really interesting case. Um, I think this is a running segment in San Francisco along the Embarcadero. So the purple uh, little arrowheads are people's actual GPS points. And the red line in the diagram is the original segment data. It's pretty bad. Uh, the various other colored lines are samples uh, with various training sets, um, the median of that training set. So it works, we get a better segment than we did initially, but I still am not convinced this is good. Uh, we have earlier flaws, we're still tying it to a single activity. And so what if we had a better way um, to do this? So this is another example of one of the uh, segments that gets fixed a little bit by metoid repair, but not, not sufficiently. Again, the red line here is the original and the colored lines are sampled medians. So I wish I could take credit for this because it's super clever, but I cannot. Um, rather than choosing the best choice, we actually try to synthesize a candidate from any sort of seated guess. So Francois Pettijon came up with this very clever idea. You start with some guess. Doesn't matter, you can use the metoid, you can use a random element. In practice, it really doesn't matter, it converges incredibly quickly. And then in parallel, you're going to take that guess and run the time warp alignment from that guess to every element in your training set. In practice, we use about 30 elements in the training set, this is pretty fast. Each point in the repair candidate is tied to at least one point from every other training sequence. In practice, it's usually tied to one or two points, which is pretty efficient. And then for each of those points, we're gonna clump them up and compute the barycenter or the centroid of those points and update it, update that point to its barycenter. So here, and again, picture worth a lot more than talking about it. Uh, you can start with some arbitrary sequence here. This is a pretty terrible guess at what the consensus sequence might be for these two training pieces of data. And we start down here at this point and we're gonna align it. We're gonna align this whole sequence to the red thing and we're gonna align this whole sequence to the blue thing. This point is tied to these three points here. So after this iteration, we replace this point with the centroid of this point, this point, and this point. Next up, this point after alignment gets aligned to this point and this point, so we're going to replace it with their centroid. And we do this iteratively until we see something that looks more like the right diagram. So already you can sort of start to see that the, the black line is converging towards a perhaps more sensible guess at what the consensus sequence should be. And we, you run this until 
in practice, you run this until uh, you reach some sort of tolerance and you don't get much improvement or much movement. So in practice, in order to do this quickly, you have to pre-process your data. Um, training data, sometimes if you go for a run, you sit down at a cafe for lunch and you leave your GPS running, you're going to just keep generating samples of you sitting on that bench. But you might be in the midst of a run on a segment. And so when I load up your match segment, I'm going to see, wow, you know, Jane Doe was running for 45 minutes on like a tenth of a mile segment. And there's like 4,000 GPS points in one spot. So in order to combat that, we pass all this data through a polyline simplification pass, uh, which is parameterized by uh, a distance parameter. So you sort of throw out detail below that level of granularity. And we pick about three meters in practice. It works OK. Um, so for most. Uh, streams that we pull in, the length is between sort of two to 3,000 points. And running this simplification filter, this polyline simplification filter over it, reduces that down to around 400 or so. Additionally, we restrict data. We restrict our training set to data that comes from devices recorded on barometric altimeters. The premise there being that we'll have more reliable altitude data. Another interesting implementation detail, instead of actually computing this time, the, the time warp distance naively is quadratic. It takes, uh, it's quite slow. But you can actually build this approximation algorithm. Another very clever guy came up with this. Um, that sort of instead of looking at the whole window for the dynamic time warp, it instead looks at points near the main diagonal. So it projects a coarse warp path onto the diagonal, computes. Uh, the adjacency sort of computes the neighbors in that warp path and then reruns the time warp. But instead of running over all of the cells, it only runs over, ah, goodness. Um, it only runs over the gray cells. So in this way, you get time takes time proportional to the length of the diagonal rather than the area of the box. Um, in practice, uh, this is implemented as a C native library. Uh, as far as I know, I think it's the fastest known implementation of this. I benchmarked it against like five or six other implementations and fairly sure it's the fastest. Um, I started off with a Scala implementation and that was, that was a bad idea. Um, it, was, it was quite slow, but switching to sort of closer to the metal code was quite efficient. Um, let's see. So finally, post-processing on this data set. Um, once we have our repair, it's important to clean up sort of the rough edges. So we polyline filter that. We run a median filter across it to remove spiky data. And then we run a quadratic filter to smooth it out. So let's see what that, let's take a look at that. So here is uh, some bad data. This is a climb in California. And you can see sort of at the start of the climb, I don't know what the heck's going on. Someone is riding like crazy and there's some diagonal cutting across the road. And, and it's basically just GPS noise. But there's enough data on this climb that we can build a sensible repair. So here's what it looks like after repair. Um, now, I want to stress that we don't have to be perfect in our segment repair. We just have to be better. And we have to be statistically significantly better. So I would not claim that this blue line is perfect. I think there's some weird stuff also going on in the blue line. Um, for instance, down there where it says Sam McDonald County Park, there is a little bit of a blue spike, which doesn't make sense. But um, but we have validation statistics. So we can rerun our matching engine over the original data and over the repaired data and see that the match progress, in this case, got about 0.46% better. And the jump quality, which is how much it jumps away from the tile set, got about 1.5% better. So this is a pretty common result. It's not phenomenally better, but it's better enough that I would accept this repair. So the way this is surfaced to our users is through, right now, um, an admin tool for Strava support that lets them manually repair segments. But we're in the process of running this repair tool over all of our data set. So finally, a little bit of accumulated wisdom. Um, this is mostly from engineering wisdom. It's important to handle altitude streams separately. There are a lot higher variance, uh, especially from barometric data, which comes into you sort of as relative altitude diffs. Um, and it's important to sort of separate those out and work with them independently. Um, Switching to a native library was very important. It picked up a huge amount of performance from that. Pre-processing data by simplifying the polylines, biggest single optimization. It's, it's phenomenal how much you get for free with like a fairly, fairly straightforward simplification algorithm. Um, in sort of organizational terms, building visualizations early was something reasonably new to me, but that helped debug quite a bit. And putting the tool in the hands of our support staff was actually really useful um, because once you have humans passing judgment on the quality of your repair, you start to see patterns and see what the tool is doing well and, and poorly. 
And then finally, building something you're comfortable throwing away. For me, it's really hard to throw away my babies, but um, having sort of the sense that it's okay to have a disposable prototype was important. Great, so I've stolen a bunch of code and diagrams and other stuff shamelessly from these papers, but they are delightful and they're quite easy to read, so it's worth reading if you are interested. Thanks, time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and please wait for the mic to get to you so that the video can pick up your question. Uh, did you run into principal curve analysis when you were doing the research on this? So the question was, did I run into principal curve analysis? And the answer is no. Tell me about that. Um, so it's it's a paper by a guy at the, uh, I think the University of Montreal or something like that, where it's taking essentially probe data and trying to figure out what curve best fits a set of points, essentially by minimizing distance algorithms, or sorry, by minimizing mm -hmm. distance metrics. Mm -hmm. It seems somewhat similar. It seems very this. similar, yeah. yeah. Um, that sounds a lot like the calculus of variations approach, probably. Um, I'll have to look at that. Cool. Okay, yeah, I'll send you the, the papers I have in the, in the sample code that the uh, awesome. researcher wrote. Great, thank you, yeah. How does this relate or compare to the slide tool from Strava a couple of years ago? Great, good question. Um, so the slide tool, um, I think Dr. Mock is here so we can answer questions about that. But um, the slide tool is, uh, it uses the, our heat map data. Um, so it takes all of the activities that pass through a given point in space and it builds sort of a 3D surface that gets has a minimizer passed across it. Um, and in this way, it sort of allows you to run this sort of process over the entire world at once um, because it's using all of the activity data. I was interested in more of a targeted segment level thing. Um, additionally, uh, uh, the this, this slide tool is uh, very, it's like, it's very well suited for like large polylines and I wanted to focus on something a little smaller. Okay. Any other questions? So the, the last step that you described was uh, manual review and acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, are there any plans to, to fully automate, or how would you approach that? Yes. Um, so uh, I've built some some code into place that sort of looks at sort of like a test statistic, like how 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 likely would it be that we would see these matching statistics, given that given that in fact it's not <laughs> excuse me, given that it is not statistically significantly better. Um, so automating acceptance would basically, I would imagine it would be looking at the, the distribution of those test statistics and then building some sort of robust test that could accept or reject automatically. Anyone else? No? Oh, one more. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, this might be a quick question, but do you have any idea or, or any sense why we would see things like that blue bulge, and I think it was slide 27, where the quote improved trail has some, some strange happenings? I have some conjectures. Um, one of them has to do with, I think it could be an artifact of the window width on the, the median filtering. Um, so choosing, it's, it's just another parameter to tune, um, and I think you could be seeing some sort of like smoothing artifacts there from people who, maybe pulled into the parking lot in that particular case. It's, it's hard to tell, but um, usually that sort of thing, when I was debugging it, it was, it was usually window width parameter sort of thing. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. Thanks.